questions from that. You are listening to Musician Today, weekly podcast with Vera Bermenko. Tune in for your insight into a professional musician's life and awesome new music. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Musician Today podcast. As you know, I started my podcast to bring musicians together and unite people in their love of music. And well, this week we have a very special treat because we have Gary Diggins from Silence. He's so kind to join us this week and shedding some light on the importance of amazing organization local to Guelph, Ontario, Silence, created by artists and for artists in support of new music. Uh, one of the reasons we established Silence was there were too many <coughs> remarkable musicians living in a past and passing through our community that were not being heard. And that's a quote by Daniel Fischlin, founder of Silence, founding director. Um, you can always find and follow Silence on their website if you do not hear anything from us today that you'd like to know at silencesounds.ca, on Facebook at forward slash Silence Guelph Ontario, on Instagram at forward slash Silence Guelph, and you can always find Gary as well on his website at garydiggins.com. And before we go on any further, I would like to tell you a bit more about what Silence does and who they are. Silence is dedicated to presenting sound and musical practices that are diverse, challenging, and accessible through concerts, workshops, and improvisation sessions. Silence serves as an incubator for practitioners and listeners alike. It fosters risk-taking, innovation, and experimentation in all forms of music and sound, as well as other artistic expressions presented in this space. Silence is a well and will remain an accessible space for all incredible, amazing artists. In history, it was established basically in May 2014 as a group of artists, musicians brought together by building and a non-profit corporation. We focused on a wide array of improvisational, experimental musical practices that highlighted collaboration, community building, and the practice of deep listening. Now, deep listening, something that we're going to talk today about, because it's a very interesting concept that I myself have been curious about my whole life. <laughs> Silence has evolved into um, include a broader range of genres, including classical, singer-songwriter, alternative folk, and world music. Um, the focus remains on new experimental improvised music, but many other artists are welcome. A silence has become a unique combination of venue and incubator for new music practices. And, whoa, I think I already read that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that we have a better person to talk about that today. And Gary, Gary Diggins has worked for over three decades as an expressive arts therapist. His work combines counseling, mindful practices, and music and medicine. As an educator, Gary teaches in the Expressive Arts Department at Fleming College. He provides workshops and lectures at various learning institutes from Laurier University to Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Gary is, uh, Gary is the author of Tuning the Eardrums, Listening as a Mindful Practice, and Invocations, a collection of poetry. Hopefully, we'll get to hear some of that today. <laughs> His <coughs> new novel will be released this summer, so yay! Congratulations! <laughs> Gary's work has taken him to communities affected by conflict, especially in Africa and Israel. At home, Gary has supported artistic clients at Toronto's Geneva Sh Center, cancer patients at Sick Kids Hospital, and addiction recovery groups. In addition to Gary's therapeutic practice, he continues to perform internationally as a cornet player and multi-instrumentalist artist. He plays a range of acoustic instruments from around the world, combining ancient sounds with modern music. The airways airwaves become a canvas for imaginative soundscapes. Gary has appeared in dozens of recordings and composed for three films. His musical collaborations have taken him to India, Israel, Israel Europe, throughout North America. Gary has collaborated with artists organizations ranging from Cirque du Soleil to Canadian composer Armie Ray Schaefer. Along with three other artists, Gary is a co-owner and art space in Guelph that houses Silence, a non-for-profit collaborative that we're going to talk to you about today and how Silence actually brings the community of artists together and the crucial role that it does play in our lives. So, whoa, I'm out of breath. Welcome, Gary. <laughs> Welcome to the show. It was quite an intro. <laughs> wow. Thank Thanks you for, for being here that. today. Thanks for taking the time. We're so honored. And first and foremost, I think what I wanted to say is um, 
I love your work. I love all this therapeutic practice that you do. And the concept of deep listening has been something that stayed with me ever since I met David Mott. <laughs> oh, oh. So I started with him, so that's amazing. Um, yeah, so what can you tell us how, what prompted you and others to create silence? What was the like, aha moment? Oh, we're gonna make this into an actual organization. <laughs> Ah, well, I'm I'm sitting in silence now, as you can probably see the moniker uh, behind me, and um, it's been empty for we're approaching now four months. And um, when I moved several years ago from Toronto to Guelph, my move had been preceded by uh, another friend, a hurdy gurdy player by the name of Ben Grossman. And he had rented a very small section of this uh, 2,000 square foot uh, building. And he was hosting uh, various boutique kinds of musical gatherings, uh, one of which was called Morning Music. And Morning Music was an opportunity for people from the communi community to gather and create an improvisational approach to music making for about an hour to 90 minutes. So you would have people who make their livelihood from music sitting next to somebody who was just learning to play an instrument or who had never played an instrument before, but was curious about shaping sound and whatnot. So uh, during the, the time of my kind of uh, entry into the community of Guelph, it was an oasis for me to come to, to that gathering of morning music. And all of a sudden, the owner of the building said, uh, I think it's time for me to sell. <laughs> and my heartstrings were tugged. I thought, oh my goodness, this is such a, an integral part of my life. Uh, I can't imagine not having this as a, as a regular place, not only for me, uh, but for friends to gather and, and create music. So I'm sitting next to Daniel Fishlin and the two of us uh, who really didn't socialize much outside of the, the context of improvising together, um, had a coffee, had a conversation and took the flying leap to say, let's purchase the building, let's renovate the building, let's make silence not just a, a, a small version of itself, but let's create a, a cooperative with a board, with a volunteer staff, and eventually with an executive director. And I think what really drove that was uh, to say that we, uh, as artists and audiences, need a place where we can practice that uh, act of listening. That's true. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> And um, how did you personally begin your work in music therapy? And do you have anyone who inspired you to do it? Or is it kind of like a totally new thing? Well, I've been at this for many decades now. Uh, the genesis of it happened uh, when I was a, a working musician down in the Windsor, Detroit area. So I was playing in an eight-piece, what we called fusion band, um, and we were working uh, regularly in the Detroit area, warming up for people like uh, Alice Cooper and Sly and the Family Stone and, and Ted Nugent and the MC5 and that whole Detroit scene. So I was immersed in the performing side of, of music really intensively. Um, and then one day, this friend of mine said, uh, I'm going to take you to this dodgy part of Detroit. Uh, it was in a section that uh, I rarely went into. But he said, I want you to meet this man from Colombia, South America. And he described him as a shaman. So in older cultures, often medicine women and medicine men uh, generically were referred to as shamans. And in their bag of, of uh, offerings, they often were conversant in how to use the voice or how to use a musical instrument in a way that would uh, bring medicine to the, the ritual of, of healing. And this man that uh, I met had just a, a mastery of especially the percussive uh, arts in that regard. So 
my interactions with him, I studied with him for uh, a number of months, set up a kind of schism in me, right? This divide where, you know, at, at one level, you're being an entertainer uh, and, and br bringing that craft that you've developed over so many years. But on the other side, in a very intimate way with just a half a dozen people, I was experiencing something that was so... I, I, I hesitate to use this word because it's a bit cliche, but so magical. Right? It really touched my soul. And so I wanted more of this, more of the healing arts and less of the performing arts. And that was the kind of crossroads uh, for me to begin to discover um, how that ancient practice this could be applied in, in contemporary ways. So it took me off into the path, the study of, of um, especially Jungian psychology, uh, understanding uh, the, the therapeutic side of sound and, and music and, and the voice. But it also brought me in touch with uh, older cultures, indigenous cultures, who predated uh, what we know today as, as music therapy. Amazing. I love all of that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to brag, but I also have a book which um, I actually found it around the healing method that has to do with sound vibration and music. And I'd yeah. love to give you a copy next time I see you. <laughs> oh, lovely. Well, very good. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I, I think a lot of artists are realizing that um, in a concert context, there's a kind of ritual space that we create. Mm -hmm. And if we're conscientious about that, it's not just uh, performing to a passive audience, but there's a kind of uh, exchange, almost like the conversation that we're having, where something quite special can happen. And, and a lot of that has to do with the ability to really drop into the, into the moment together. So it becomes almost like a meditative practice. I was so inspired by our interview today that I took my spirit drum into the woods this weekend and just yes. jammed it around the trees and with dogs around me. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Um, so would you be able to play something for us today? Do you have anything in mind? Yeah, I'm, I'm not in my usual space, which is uh, I have a, a therapeutic space in, in the back of silence. Um, but handy, let's see, uh, I'll show, we'll do a show and tell here. Let's do that. Uh, here's a couple of things that came out of that space today. This is a, a stringed instrument that um, uh, I, I tuned to a, a, a lovely uh, scale. I, I'll just give you a little tip of this and then I'll do something else. But this has a, a beautiful... Uh, Can you hear that? Yeah, it sounds beautiful. Huh. It reminds yeah. me a bit of, um, yeah, you know, Persian Sun Tour. Yes, exactly. I've been a Persian band for about 10 years. <laughs> yeah, my uh, good friend plays it. <laughs> yes. So that's that's really based on the, as you say, the Persian uh, sun tour. This is, um, I'll just give you a snippet of this other instrument over here. This All is right. uh, this is becoming uh, certainly more available to people. Originally, the hung was the only instrument uh, that you could get out of Bern, Switzerland. And subsequently, uh, other makers than Felix and Sabine, the, the originators, have, have developed their own version. Uh, this one actually comes from uh, Israel. It has a, you would know this, the Hijaz scale, the D jazz scale. So it sounds like this. Yeah. This guy, I've played on it. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. So um, I really started out as a as a cornet player, 
um, I was standing over a pool table and my uncle put on a recording of uh, Miles Davis and I asked my father, uh, what's that instrument and could I study it? He said, well, it's a trumpet. It's a bit big for you, so we'll get you started on the, the cornet, which is a, a much more um, manageable one for a little gaffer. So um, I'll, uh, I'll just change the tuning on this little guy. This is a Shruti box. In uh, Indian music, there is always a, a drone or a home center, yes. which provides the kind of um, place from which you journey and return. So we'll do a little meditation on, uh, on the, there's the Shruti. pitches at the same time so yeah yeah <laughs> it's a it's an unusual technique uh for horn players because usually as you know you're just working on that singular intonation but there are ways to bring in the harmonics and multiphonics mm -hmm. on the horn uh, which gives it more more of an impressionistic approach which in the therapeutic use of music um you're then bringing in ambient sounds that don't have a reference to uh, particularly popular music, per se. Yeah, so it, it, it's a kind of painting with sound. Yeah. I love that. That's definitely what David Mott talked about all the time I studied. <laughs> yes, definitely. But we uh, here uh, on a couple of occasions and um, the beauty of silence is that it's only uh, capable of seating about 70 people or so so there's quite an intimacy so when you have somebody like David um, you're you're almost in a living room setting yeah. and that matter of exchange of breathing together listening together becomes quite real mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that's amazing um, so how, um, so uh, you told us some of the unique instruments that you play and yes. what would you be like, how, how many instruments overall do you think you've explored throughout your path? Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had to do, uh, for my insurance broker, I had to do a tally of how many instruments I had, uh, God forbid that anything could happen uh, to those instruments because they're not like you could go to Long and McQuaid and replace them. They're, a lot of them are handcrafted. And uh, there were over 200 instruments in, the, in my back room there. Um, but I would say that uh, 
uh, some of those are really user friendly. So if I'm working with a client, he or she may or may not come from uh, a musical background, but take an instrument like the spirit drum, uh, which is similar to to the hand pen that I, I played, only can play it with mallets. That person then can express what they're uh, working with in an interior way through user-friendly instruments. And also in the backspace, I have instruments that keep me humble in the sense that um, I'm, I'm the student of those instruments. I've just recently picked up the uh, shakuhachi flute from Japan because of its great tradition in, in uh, meditation. Uh, the breathing causes you to get into quite a Zen state in that regard. But it's for a pentatonic instrument made out of bamboo, it's a very challenging uh, instrument to play. You know. Yeah. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> so uh, I know your new novel comes out this summer. Congratulations, yes. by the way. Um, Thank you. Can you tell us about it? Is there a sneak peek you can give us as in what is it about? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I'll, uh, uh, the, the story is set in the late 60s in the area that I grew up in, in, in the Windsor, Detroit area. And it follows the life of uh, six musicians who begin to work in, a, first of all, in an improvised kind of way. Uh, back then, they would have been called a... a a jam band, for instance, mm -hmm. and into their midst comes a violinist. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> the Whenever a violinist comes into <laughs> a story or a person's life, the plot thickens. <laughs> so, so this violinist is from uh, India, and yet she studied classical music in uh, London, England as well, and she straddles improvisational music. So kind of like a lot of your uh, qualities there in terms of studying <laughs> world music and, and classical music simultaneously, yes, right? So she begins to introduce them to uh, styles of playing and styles of improvisation that blend uh, structure and freedom. And, and they begin to get notice uh, down in that area. But... That's the, the, the kind of surface of the, of the story. At the same time, the individuals are really struggling with uh, personal trauma, uh, recovering from a trauma. Uh, one person has uh, dual addiction issues. Uh, another person uh, is really working with the, the kind of racism of the backdrop of, of that time. And so uh, each of them has their own stories embedded in the, the overarching story. But the thing that you would probably be drawn to is the fact that music becomes this balm, becomes this way for them to uh, explore and express and find um, a, a, not relief so much from their, their difficulties, but a way of giving that uh, voice of, of utterance. Yeah. The working title, and I think it's going to stick, it'll probably be out in, in uh, July or early August, is called uh, Slow Dancing in Fast Times. And it comes from the musical um, uh, direction Lento, L-E-N-P-O, when you see that, that's, you know, yeah. just a, a, a bit slower than Adagio. And it's, it's a way to... Um, when things are whirling and swirling around you, how do you find that place of, of lento, the still point in the turning world? <laughs> I feel like this is so true in our today's situation, actually, that people mm -hmm. are looking for a way to sort of slow down their mind from all these crazy events that we're experiencing at the moment. And yeah. the change is great, the change is amazing, but we also have to find a way to sort of calm ourselves and not get overwhelmed. So I feel like this is the best thing to read right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as you know, working with students, um, there's so much that 
you have to bring to the moment. There's there's the technique. There's the attention to um, everything from posture to to intonation. Um, there's also if you're playing in an ensemble, you have to be connecting with the people around you and. I feel that uh, especially young people coming up, they benefit by studying music to gain life skills that apply in other areas beyond music making, right? And one of the primary skills is to bring yourself into the moment and if you can, uh, suspend your judgment about what's happening. You we both know as musicians that that critical voice can be uh, pretty loud at times. We're, we're playing and then there's this uh, internal racket that, that's going on. And so approaching music making as a mindfulness practice, I think, is one of the ways for people to, um, to gain a certain skill that's applicable in many different areas. And um, yeah. like it's the one way to unify all humanity within ourselves because it all begins with us, right? With each person yeah. individually. By looking within, we actually gain more that we can then share outward. Well put. So well put. <laughs> Thank uh, you. And, and, and so also been yeah. fascinated with the fact that, um, you know, we, right now we're communicating using our, our voice. And just like snowflakes, uh, your voice has a signature mm -hmm. pattern to it. Uh, my voice on a spectrogram would look a certain way. And so as a metaphor, it's very beautiful to say that um, even though we have a number of things in common, we are each an irreplaceable being in that regard. And that's that comes through in, in music making, if, if someone is, uh, if Yo-Yo Ma is, is playing uh, uh, box cello concertos, that's going to be quite different than an, an, another artist yeah. because he brings his imprint to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder, what can you tell us about the morning music program at Silence and uh, how you cultivate mindfulness practice with your students? Yeah, so first of all, the morning music is uh, less of a, a teacher-student context. In fact, I would think of myself just more of a, a host in those uh, gatherings, those weekly gatherings. And uh, one of the things that we really ask the participants to honor is uh, silence, right? Yeah. Is to say that if we're creating something together that's never been rehearsed, it's not notated, then there are a number of different ways that the principle of silence uh, can be applied. One is to, you know, be silent within yourself so that you're leaning in with an attentiveness, um, but also as a player or performer uh, to not always be generating sound, that there are these uh, pauses and moments where you're the receiver of sound, not just the, the giver of sound. The great uh, jazz musician Miles Davis said that uh, it's not always where you play, it's where you don't play, right? That, that those silence periods are as equally uh, as important. And then um, for professional musicians like yourself, the encouragement would be to work with extended technique, to, to explore some things that uh, you, you might not always do on the, on the stage, but to, to kind of broaden your repertoire of possibility, try them out because it's a safe space. Um, there's no one judging. We're not performing for anybody in that regard. And for individuals on the other end of the spectrum who have never played an instrument before to feel that they have something called musical intelligence. If we're alive as a human being, uh, it may not be our, at the top of our aptitude list, but if you walk, if you talk, uh, you've got music in you. And how can you then express that in a way <clears throat> that fits into the context of community music making. So I've seen people who um, initially come and maybe they're a poet 
or maybe they're a visual artist and they'll sit quietly and take in the, the vibe. Uh, they might be sketching uh, or they might be writing some words. Next time they come, they feel, okay, this is a safe space for me to express, again, that uniqueness that I have or the unique way that I perceive music making. And so it's really, at its best, um, it's like a shifting soundscape that sometimes gets very uh, gregarious and, and chaotic and at other times gets really uh, contemplative and, and respectful of sounds that are wanting to, to come in. And at its best moments, you would know this as an improviser, you don't feel like you're making music, but you're feeling that music is making something through you. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that does remind me. Um, we had our improv class at York with Casey Sockel and Matt Brewer. Oh. And yeah, it was often not so much about playing, but it's like 99.9% .9 all about listening. Yes, yes. One of my major influences in this regard is Pauline Oliveras, and she um, was the founder and director of the Deep Listening Institute. You know? And so her uh, encouragement, not only to musicians, but to the general public, was to make that uh, a core practice in, in your life. So then in exchanges with family members or when you're going through a tough time with your partner or when uh, you're listening to a person uh, who doesn't come from your background, uh, maybe a person of color that I'm, I'm having an exchange with, for me to uh, spill my mouth and open my ears and, and hear what it's like for that person, yeah. what's it like for them. Such an important message in today's world. Uh, yeah. So through you and organizations like Silence, who are bringing people together in the most caring and loving way through music <laughs> worldwide. And I wonder how do you actually find the time to do all of your international projects? <laughs> Today, that's no problem. <laughs> I can't go anywhere. I, I live a couple of blocks from silence, so my, my uh, daily routine looks like walking to silence, walking to home, maybe going out occasionally to get some groceries. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, back in the day, as it were, uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, a family that supported me. I'm a father of four kids. Um, so for me to be away for chunks at time, of times, for instance, when I would go to Africa, I might be there for uh, a number of weeks, uh, upwards of a month sometimes. Uh, those uh, uh, adventures out beyond my abode had to be supported by uh, a, f a family who understood that. Uh, clients also had to understand that uh, there would be a disrupt to the regime and routine that we had established. Um, but I, I have to tell you, quite frankly, with this COVID-19 pandemic, um, I'm really having second thoughts about uh, how much I want to travel or what that looks like. I think Increasingly, we're um, having to consider a different version of normal. And when I think about the environmental impact of just flying hither and yon, uh, I really will have to weigh carefully where it is that I go. Um, I think there's a, there's a good um, practice about growing a garden where you are, growing a, a garden of beauty where you are. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> uh, so is there um, a way for people who are listening to support silence, to make sure that the organization stays open even through the quarantine days, lockdown, as many businesses are shutting down and yeah. hopefully will reopen very soon. Is there a way for people to actually show their support? What can we do to help? Okay, very good. Um, just as, as a kind of lead into answering that question, I have to say that we're really grateful for the various funding organizations that have 
helped us during this time. Uh, Canada Council for the Grant, uh, Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, um, uh, even the CERB program that has uh, helped musicians. Uh, so, uh, as you can appreciate, uh, being living up to our name of, of silence, <laughs> we are dialed down to a very quiet state right now. Uh, so we're unable to generate uh, revenue in the usual ways of audiences coming. So we're just gearing up for a fundraising campaign that will, um, you know, in the old days, we used to have patrons of the arts. We had would support the box and the Mozarts of, of that time. So uh, we're reaching out to the everyday person who has benefited from silence, uh, to individuals who maybe on the other side of the world have visited uh, silence and, and want to uh, help us out. But we're also aware that there are uh, organizations right here in, in Guelph, uh, financial institutions, um, insurance companies, etc., who we have partnership with. And we bring something of culture to the city of Guelph. And so in that principle of reciprocity of giving and receiving, we'll be reaching out to people to give what they can, give within their means, uh, but help us ensure that this, as we put it before, incubator for the arts is uh, kept warm, is kept hot. <laughs> and we, none of us know in these unprecedented times when the doors of silence will open again. So we have uh, ongoing expenses to pay. We have an executive uh, director who's been active with her team of people to um, find innovative ways to keep the, the, the voice of silence uh, out there. So we have, and yeah. what do you do at the moment to try to reach out to people? As in, do you have any projects that will go online? Do you have any releases coming up? Yes, we have a couple. Um, so one is uh, before uh, the COVID-19 scenario, we were gearing up for a really big project that we had won a grant for uh, called River Chance. And uh, Guelph here is permeated by a number of waterways, the Grand River, the Aramosa, the Speed Rivers. And our pitch to the council was that we would like to do uh, a really ambitious project in partnership with the Wellington Water Watchers, uh, in partnership with um, an educational uh, component about right water stewardship. And we had uh, everything from a big parade that involved a massive grouping of people marching from one of the, the water sites to silence to um, an improvisational uh, multidisciplinary uh, presentation that involved images of water um, to uh, poets who have written about water and a seven piece uh, orchestra uh, of, of improvisers. And all of that had to be reconfigured and had to uh, migrate to a different platform. So again, we're grateful that the uh, Canada Council for the Arts uh, recognized that we were challenged to bring this into a live context, but that we would do our best to uh, rework it and deliver it as a as a river chance uh, digital project. So that's in the uh, the kind of mixing and mastering stages, and certainly uh, through the Silence website, we'll keep you posted about about that one. Amazing! Yeah. And again, yeah. if you guys forgot, you can always check out the Silence website and find all the necessary information how you can support the organization and how you can see all these amazing projects when they come out. SilenceSounds.ca Right, so all the info is there. Contact information is there. You can write to Gary directly. <laughs> and uh, I also follow you on Facebook and Instagram. So it's Silence Guelph Ontario on Facebook. It's a Silence Guelph on Instagram. You know, people like Instagram these days. I like it too. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> so here we go. Um, before we continue, Gary, would you like to play something that I call sort of like a rapid fire game? 
So, oh, okay. <laughs> speaking sure. about, you know, slowing down our mind, but here we go. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you 10 questions in under a minute. And the, basically what you answer is the first thing that comes to your mind. Would like you like a word type? or a phrase? Yeah. Like a word or a phrase? Yeah. yeah. It could be a word. It could be a sentence. So as long as we make it within a minute. And most people don't. So don't worry if you don't. Okay. So <laughs> 10 questions under a minute. Yes. That's it. Okay. So would you be up for playing? I, sounds like a great game. Okay. Let's do it. So I'm going to start the countdown. You won't hear it on your end, but I'll go three, two, one, and then I'll ask you the first question. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yay. Okay, here we go. So, three, two, one. First question, most memorable performance you did recently? Uh, working for the Vertical Squirrels with Dong Wan Kim from Korea. Nice. At what age did you begin learning music? Uh, tw uh, eight. Nice. What are the names of your pets? Ah, <laughs> Leonard the cat. <laughs> And the other uh, cat has has wandered off. All right. <laughs> How many instruments do you own? Ah, about 225. <laughs> nice. What motivates you? Uh, love. Yes. Which YouTuber do you watch and enjoy? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, a, a group called Scary Pockets. Nice. What are your favorite songs since ever you were little? Uh, All Blues by Miles Davis. Nice. Name three people that you admire. Ah, uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, Martin Luther King. Amazing. So we ran out of time, but I don't see why we can't finish. There's two more questions left. <laughs> okay. Are you a dog person or a cat person? I'm a dog person that has a cat. <laughs> <laughs> now, name three artists with who you have recently collaborated. Ah, um, Jeff Bird from the Cowboy Junkies, um, um, Louis Melville, uh, who is uh, local as well, and I, uh, Matt Brubeck, who's the the son of uh, Dave Brubeck. Nice. Yeah, that's amazing. I love Matt. He's so like, uh, he's been such an inspiration to me personally, too. Like, when we studied at York, when I studied at York, he was teaching at York. So we were part of this um, improvisation ensemble inside Casey Sockle's class. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. York is going to be, be missing uh, Casey because he's, he's retired. This was yeah, his. I know. Uh, I know. So you're fortunate to have him for a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. It's just changed my life. It's all of those, you know, things that I've been reading about mindfulness and just all of that changed my the way I practice music, the way I learn music, the way I do anything in music has changed in that class. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, thank well. you for playing, Gary. That was so much fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't make it an under a minute, but that's okay. <laughs> we got 80 80 percent. <laughs> yes. Amazing. So I can't wait for the uh, silence to be back on its feet. I can't wait to see more amazing acts. I went to the show last year. We had this creative visual performance. Um, oh my God, I forget the names. It was a visual art displayed on the screen, played together with clarinet. Was it clarinet? Uh, I believe so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't recall right now, I lost everything in my mind. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so it was amazing, just the whole experience of going into that space and having these interdisciplinary arts coming together, telling a story. It just Definitely. It was mind blowing. <laughs> so thank you for doing what you do. We appreciate it so much. And uh, you guys go on the uh, website and see the ways that you can help, that you can help keep the organization alive, keep amazing performances coming in, support the artists, go to silencesounds.ca and show your support there. Meanwhile, I just wanted to ask you for one more last thing is yes. what would be your message to the young artists today? those who are exploring new music, those who want to have their voices heard in that way, what would be your big sort of advice of taking the direction that they should be kind of going in? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I would encourage artists to think of themselves as activists as well. That um, it doesn't mean that you have to tether yourself to a particular cause, but to think of the act of music making uh, as being a contributing force to the well-being of the world. That uh, every time you blow, strike, uh, pluck an instrument, that you do so with intentionality, that um, it's in line with this uh, old uh, Sanskrit notion of Nada Brahma, which means the world is vibration. And the vibration that we put out creates a, a particular kind of world. So that's why culture is so important. It's a catalytic agent in these times of, of deep change. And artists, I, I feel, uh, regardless of the genre that they're in, can bring such um, intentionality to their uh, offerings. I agree. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, where can we read your already published books, and where can we expect your new novel to come out? Yeah. So, I'll just. Uh, these are the ones that are already out. Uh, Tuning the eardrums. Listening is a mindful practice. So that's uh, available on Amazon. Great. And uh, this one here uh, is Invocations: Poems for the Air and the Ear. And uh, you can just write to me if, if you want a copy of that. Amazon. Um, can I read a piece from this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think that would be lovely. Okay. So this is applicable to the sense that um, none of us really own music. If, if we've created music, um, again, there's the sense that something plays us rather than us playing music, right? Uh, so this one's called Song Lines. It says, some songs can't be owned, can't be copyrighted. They arrive on loan for purposes other than nostalgia. Humpback whales are like jazz musicians, changing up their signals as they cross scores of oceans. In the dark of tonight, why call up melodies from another time? Those passages have moved on. I'd prefer to swim in nameless waterways, accompanied by momentary music. Dial in the unrehearsed, dial up edge and risk. In between static and ghostly sounds, we might pick up enough fragments to veer us into uncharted waters. I imagine whales and saxophonists saying, even getting lost is better than playing it safe. <laughs> Bravo, <laughs> thank you, that was beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gary, so much for being on the show. And uh, I'm so excited to have you here and reshare this show with everyone who's watching right now. Meanwhile, I would love to have you back sometime, perhaps when the silence reopens and we have a show coming up or you have a new message to sort of share with us. I would love to host you back here again so you can give us an update and share with us perhaps your new release. Can we make a deal of this? Sure. That I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> If you'll come to silence and I can host you here, oh. especially, especially if you have your new Mark Woods violin with you. Amazing. Yes, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to do my first concert for my album at silence. Oh, wow. That'd be an honor. <laughs> hey. So, yeah, I can't wait. Looking forward to it. That'd be amazing. So, we don't know when, but um, this would be such a great thing. So, I don't know when my instrument arrives either, but when it does... Let's contact each other, and we'll make something happen for sure. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Have an amazing week. Um, enjoy the day, <laughs> making music and the beautiful weather. <laughs> and I can't wait to see you back. Happy solstice on Saturday. Yes. It's summer. Happy Yay. solstice. Thank you, Gary. Hey. Okay. Bye. Bye for now. That's all, folks. If you like Iron Fiddle songs, download them at theurbermanka.com forward slash music. See you next.